Hello, thank you for coming. Um, there were a lot of talks about new technology, and actually we will talk about a little bit about all dimensions in uh, type engineering, and how you can use the knowledge from actually Renaissance typefaces and patterning from that time in uh, present-day digital typefaces. So how archetypal patterns can improve the production of digital type? What will we do? Uh, first, Lucas will show you some batch alter spacing based on cadencing. Then I will tell you a little bit about my research. And at the end, Lucas will give you a more detailed demonstration of, uh, of his tools. So first, Lucas. Thank you, Frank. Is the microphone? Yeah. It's working. So, um, yeah, as Marina uh, already introduced me, I studied at the Type Media Program and I also went to Antwerp to uh, study at the expert class. And uh, there I got some insights to Frank's research. And actually, um, um, this all started as a small experiment. I, I never expected that this would be, uh, would end up in a, in a huge, um, project, and but I'm I'm also a type designer and um, uh, less a, a programmer. So I uh, recently designed um, a historical typeface based on Hendrik van den Kiere, uh, which is also related to Frank's uh, theory or research. And um, maybe you want to say something about. This is the Flamande, which originally was made by Matthew Carter based on Van der Keer. Van der Keer was a punch cutter from the times of Garamond. And he also worked for uh, Plantin. He actually made an ad adaptions of, type of types of Garamond, where he shortened the ascenders and descenders. And I will show you some of that later on. Um, in 1992, I was a speaker in Hamburg at the Dido seminar. And uh, Matthew Carter was there too, a speaker. And at some point, he showed me this textura. Can you show the texture? And I asked him, what are you going to do with it? And he said, are you interested? I said, yes, I would like to have it for DTL. And he said, well, you can have it. But I was a, a bit hesitant at that time, because uh, a texture in the library would, would change the t total image of the DTL type library. So I waited 25 years and asked Lucas actually to finish the typeface. So this is now the Flamande. And I asked him also to make the Gros Canon. And this is interesting because this is a typeface that is based on the same proportions as the Flamande. And Plantin also used capitals of Roman types like this one uh, to combine with textura. So in this case, uh, the additional characters that Lucas made can also be used, as, used for the uh, textura type. So that's the background. So, um, as I said, um, I, I was introduced to, to Frank Theory at the Plantin uh, Institute, and um, I thought uh, I could develop a tool and transfer his research in a way um, in our current production process. And as a first teaser, I prepared some uh, typefaces which are more or less uh, morphological related, morphologically related. So this is, for example, Adobe Caslon, Concord, uh, a DTL typeface, um, and some other, some of my own. And I would um, uh, like to batch auto space them. I first would like to show you how how I messed up the the character set, so it, so you can see that um, it actually doesn't work. Um, it's like this. And so this is a folder with um, eight or so typefaces. Um, and I will simply use my tool. And um, I will color the glyphs so you can see what, what, which glyphs were adjusted. And you could also adjust components um, directly. But I will um, yeah, simply apply it like this. Um, I select the folder. And so it will auto space the fonts. And I can directly show you the results. So 
So let's start with a renaissance related or inspired typeface. Um, so it, it only was applied to upper and lower case letters. Um, this is the first example. Uh, another one. So what it does, it does outer space immediately. And actually, it is a very simple principle behind it, uh, but it's, it's quite fast. And I think we should underline that, that neither uh, Lucas and I are programmers. So th this is quite a simple tool, but it's extremely powerful. And I will tell you uh, how it works and what the theory is behind it. Can you go back to the PDF? Um, what I will do, quickly, because I have half an hour for 60 slides. First, what we see, what we know, hypothesis, sub-hypothesis, standardization of character width, artifacts, type foundry material, registers of the mould, unitization of historical type, and then at the end, cadence units, or unitization of present day type. I wanted to start with something even older, the elasmosaurus, which you can see here at the bottom. And this is a, an impression by Drinker Cope. He was a paleontologist. And they found a skeleton of an elasmosaurus, and he reconstructed it. We're talking about the 19th century. And this is a drawing that he made. And you can see there's no hide pedal. They had the pedal, but it didn't fit his drawing. So he left it this way, and after 20 years, the skeleton was built in a museum, and a colleague said, well, David, I think you put a hat on the tail. It's wrong. And it was. And now we all know this animal as, as for instance, the monster of Loch Ness, and it has a long neck, but he didn't expect it. And the reason is that the stimulus patterns on the retina are not alone in determining our picture of the visual world. Its messages are modified by what we know about the real shape of objects. So we project our thoughts on it, and it's not always what we see. And when, we come, when it comes to type, uh, Kindersley said it more simpler. It's a common place that we see only what we know. And what do we know? For instance, when we talk about type from Janson, this you can find on Wikipedia, the carefully modeled serifs follow an artful logic of asymmetry. Well, well perhaps, perhaps if you isolate the character, but if you don't do that, you put it in a row, then it makes sense in a different way. Because this, this is, of course, you recognize it, the Adobe Janson made by Schlimbach, and you can see that he shortened the serifs. But what he also did, he made the spacing like you are doing it. You are making, you are trying to get the equilibrium of white space, and actually, you will move the N towards the right side bearing a little bit, because there's less black material at the right than at the left. But if you want to put the N in the center of the width, you will compensate uh, this by making the right serve longer and the left serve shorter, and even make the right serve a little bit bolder. And now you can center it, and that has a nice effect, because you get an even distribution of space between all the steps. As you can see here in, in um, the type of Janson, and, and I looked at standardization, you can see that there is a limited number of widths, and in this width, the characters are centered. And by centering, you get this equal distribution of space between the stems. So it's equilibrium of white space, and you get an even stem interval. And we all are familiar with this system because monotype didn't do anything else. And the fact that at monotype it was relatively easy to adapt type to the standardization is because the standardization is an intrinsic part of Roman type from the beginning on. This is a drawing by Van Krimpen. Van Krimpen writes in the memorandum to monotype that every designer should actually work with his own units, uh, which represent his own feeling for rhythm, and then should determine the uh, standardization of which for the matrix case, him or herself. 
When I was a student in The Hague, I was taught that Radis, the punch cutter, who you see at the right there, the uh, punch cutter who worked for Van Krimpen, did it all by eye. And that is doubtful. If you make drawings like this, which are so detailed and where the spacing is, is exactly uh, determined, then you don't want an impression by eye. And here, actually, on the picture, you see the same drawing without the superior figures, which are here at the right, at the bottom. So did he do that optically? No, he didn't. Uh, in his autobiography, he writes in Dutch, there are only 150 copies, that the first, first the photo in the right size was made. I used etching on zinc, just enough to make a suit impression from, to rub the letters on steel. I made the translation. Uh, zinc was not precise enough, and later I used red copper instead. The impression was, to, was used to transfer the image of the letter to the correct position on the blank steel, on the punch. So he used a trick, not optically, he transferred it, but he also writes in his autobiography that he invented the trick himself, and he didn't. Um, on my laptop, I have a movie from the 1950s who shows, that shows the whole process. So if you are interested, I can show you personally this, uh, this movie. But it was something that was all around there in the first half of the 20th century. And it's a, it's a logical trick. And actually, when you look on the internet, there's a small movie by Stan Nelson, and he shows how he transfers the image of foundry type with a suit impression to blank steel. And when you look at the proportions of the type of Grand Jean, Garamond van der Keren, um, and a couple of other punch cutters like Quillot, then you see the same proportions and you see only differences in details. So it, it is quite possible that they used transparently made vellum, which you can do, to transfer the images directly to the punches and then added their own idiom. Van Krimpen came to this conclusion. I have at long last formed the opinion that monotype and foundry type are and have to be looked upon as two essentially different things. What are they? On top, you see the Gros Canon from Garamond, and this was cast, newly cast in 1959, and you can see that the width of the characters are actually completely different. And this was published in a book, and for Fleet Road, can you, see, you can see how beautiful the type is, but the spacing is awful. At the bottom, you see the Moyen Canon, which is an adaptation made by Van der Keren, and the lowercase letters within the x-height are identical. So only the, the uh, a-centers and d-centers are shortened. And uh, this was just for an economical reason. You could put more type on a page. When I investigated this, and probably it's 16th or 17th century type, carbon dating is not possible because there's not enough carbon in it. But when you look at the uh, alloy, it's quite plausible that it's uh, 16th or at latest 17th century. If you go with your nail over it, you can make groups, and you can feel the same width for a number of characters. So the number of widths is completely simplified. And if you go deeper into the matter, you see more and more. This is Grand Jean. This is a movie made by a student of mine in Antwerp, Nicolas Portnoy, and he used here the matrices of Grand Jean. And this offset is made by the registers of the mood, and I will show that later. And now he unitized even the width, and he used this for a revival he's making for me. And what you can see here is that the positioning of the characters is not done optically, but directly distilled from the original matrices. So no optical, although you could say at the basis there are some optical uh, stuff, but, but this is done directly from the matrices, and the, inf the spacing information is distilled from that too. This is the commonly accepted theory. The early printers based their fonts on the writing which was current in the books of their day. They 
imitated as closely as possible so that their product might not suffer by comparison. This is Uman. Uman, he was an expert. But when you look at the originals and you look at the writing, this is Pocho on top. Pocho is one of the most famous Renaissance uh, calligraphers and often referred to when it comes to the basis of type. But if you look at the, the writing of Pocho and you compare it with, at the bottom, the type of uh, Jean Janson, then you see that there are huge differences. There are similarities, but there are huge differences. And actually, the major difference is that the calligrapher divides the space with pen strokes, and the type designer, the punch cutter, has to divide the space between these strokes. And that is really a quintessential difference, because you need to position in type the letters on rectangles. And these rectangles are foreign when it comes to writing. You don't think about rectangles, you even don't think about where does the space starts and ends. So the discussion with a C and an A, where you say the space within the letter should be placed between the letters, well, if I have a C and an E, it's difficult to define exactly where the space inside the letter ends and where the space next to the letter, letter begins. But a calligrapher doesn't look at that. He writes in the rhythm. Morrison. The goldsmith punch cutters and printers relied on their eyes and not upon their measuring tools. I can't find no proof in his books, in his writings. Not at all. So it sounds possible, but it doesn't show any proof. I investigated a lot of type, and when I looked at the, the Gros Canon, the Romain, also known as the Gras Canon, which means bold in French, and I compared it with the Canon de Spagne, which is a, is a uh, rotunda, then immediately I noticed that there was a similarity in proportion. So I enlarged the Gros Canon, and it had exactly the same proportions, even the same weight as the Rotunda, the Canon de Spagne. So this, this actually shows a highly developed um, production, and you can't do this purely by eye. That's, that's impossible. Like, Radies couldn't translate the drawings, the perfect drawings by Van Krimpen. By eye, he needed a trick. So this, this was my hypothesis of my research. The creation of Roman type was influenced at least as much by technical as by aesthetic considerations. You have to make type, and you have to let it work, and you have to, to control the whole system. When you look at the written textura quadrata from, the, uh, from 1452, 1453, then the structure is actually made for transferring this and translating this into textura type. So when you look at the textura type of Gutenberg, it's almost identical. And it's speculation, but, but perhaps it's not a coincidence that just at that time, at that moment, the uh, invention of book printing took place. In the type of Gutenberg, you find a lot of standardization, just a limited amount of width. So here, you see a 7 to 8 width in total, and mo in most type from the time, I find 7 to 8 width as a maximum, as I also shown with the image of uh, Janssons Roman. Could it be that Roman type is the result of standardization in the relations of the humanistic minuscule to the type production process, which was there already developed for textura type? Um, They were already making texture type in Germany. In Germany, uh, uh, in Mainz, also Janson worked. Uh, Swanham and Pannertz and the von Speyer brothers went to Italy. And even Janson made more Gothic type than Roman type in his life. So then it makes sense actually to, to look at it and see whether they used the knowledge, uh, the, the already unitized Gothic hand, as a basis for texture type, and could they use the same technology, the same knowledge for Roman type. And when you look at texture type, the, the structure is very simple, and uh, there's actually a limited amount of width. So an N is two units in this case, and one unit is, of course, the I, and an M is three units. If you apply this on Roman type, then first of all, you have to, to look at the morphology, and you can see that the morphology of texture type is identical to that of Roman type. The only big difference is that you have straight lines where you have curves in Roman type, and in, 
at the bottom, you could say the humanistic middle school, and the, of course, the weight is different. So I applied this on Roman type from Janson, and you find exactly the same structure. Of course, you could say, well, this is a bit fake. Yeah? The, the, uh, in this case, it will fit, but do you have a more detailed image? Yes, I have. And then you can go even further. You can find unitization, and I will come back to that later on. I made a small tool. My students use it. If Lucas can help me with the finding it on his, his computer, there it is. Um, this was programmed at UAW by Jurgen Wielrode and his team. And uh, this actually, I made a model, the metric model, which captures the movement when you write, and you can do the same as you do with writing. You can change the parameters. You can make the letters bolder. You can change the A senders and D senders. You can flatten the curves, but you can first stretch the letters. You can make them a bit smaller. You can flatten the curves, and now you can even more change the length of the A senders and D senders. And suddenly, suddenly, it's Gothic type. So you can see it's exactly the same model, the same structure. There is no difference. And yes, you can make a vari variable font of this. And probably we will make a button at the end that you push the button and you get a font variation where you have this outcome of all the sliders. A, a variable font avant la lettre, made in the Renaissance. But how do you transfer these letters? You write, you have this, this, this writing. Uh, humanistic writing, the, we, we call it the humanistic uh, middle school, and you want to make type. If you have the grid and you realize the standardization, you could write within the grid, and this is something I also do with my students in The Hague, just to make directly the step from writing to type. And there's one thing, if you learn them writing, you will learn them the foundational hand. That's common since Johnson introduced it, and it's done in The Hague for a long time, and also at other places. But this foundational hand is already adapted to the standardization of type. So we use it to prove that type finds its origin in writing, but at the same time, we adapt the writing already to type, because we have this knowledge. And when you look at the original writing from the 15th century, it's small, potio, that's only a few millimeters high. If you enlarge it, you don't find this standardization that you can apply with a broad nib for, or for instance, six millimeters that I used here. What I did, I just used the width, and then I polished the letters a bit at the bottom, put some Renaissance aspects in it, and then made type with it. So there's no optical spacing here. It's directly a translation of written letters to the grid, and then some adaptations and then this is the outcome. This is also a nice way to, to teach to young people actually what type is, because they can immediately typeset with it, they can make strokes of paper, and they can play with it. So I'm actually working on a program for primary schools, and I did some tests on the school of my daughter, uh, and the children love it. I do too, of course. Uh, it's quite interesting, and they immediately understand also what happens on the computer. Ah, these are rectangles, and... and um, automatically, irrespective of the sequence, it makes words. But you can investigate prints like I did, but of course, uh, I'm teaching also in Antwerp and have direct access to the uh, huge collection of punches, matrices, and foundry type. And I investigated these standardizations and made rows of uh, textura type. This, this is the Gros Canon Flamande and the Paragon Flamande, both from, from Van der Keren. And you can see this standardization clearly in these rows, but also in Grand Jean. And this is the Ascendonica cursive, and I showed you earlier the movie, and on top you, sh you saw also the Ascendonica cursive, and this was used, of course, by Matthew Carter for his uh, ITC Galliard. Um, and you can see that within this cursive there is a clear standardization, and the positioning is really exact in the width of the matrices. And even the raw matrices show this. 
and uh, you can make strings of them. And I think the idea that they use lumps of copper where they, uh, they, they use a strike and then they had the image in the copper, I, th I think that, that it's not correct. These probably were like chocolate bars and this was already highly standardized. One of the main reasons is that copper at the time was extremely costly. So you don't want to spoil copper and then you organize also this uh, as good as you can. And the, the justification of the matrices is much easier if already the characters are directly placed correctly within the width. Um, I spoke about registers of the mould. Here you can see the bottom of the mould and here the matrix is placed, so with the image uh, at the other side. And what the registers do is you determine the offset. And the idea that the caster did this by eye, well, sometimes they did, but you need a very trained eye. But you can put the intelligence in the matrices themselves. So you can do it in such a way that you have only one matrix, matrix like, for instance, of the L. You adjust the registers just a little bit away from the serves, and then that's it. You don't need any knowledge. We did that uh, at the museum together with a technical guy who was also a former student of mine, Guy Hutzebout, we cast from the original type from Garamol, and we could do that blindly. No optical stuff, no uh, delay actually. The intelligence is in the matrices. How does this work? I made a simple image, simple uh, drawing of a mold, and uh, these are the matrices. These are the registers, and what you can see here is that the positioning of the letters is in such a way that the offset of the mould can always be the same. So the round letters are treated like overshoot of the straight strokes. But even if the width of the characters are different, you can see, see that, still see that the offset here is identical in the C and the E and the O. And the mould you can move this way, and you keep it in your hand, and the registers are fixed. So whether the uh, matrix is wider or not doesn't matter at all, as long as the offset of the matrices, matrices is identical. And here you can see the same with matrices of Grandjean, and the red lines are the red lines that you also saw in the animation. This is the offset of the mold, and you can put all the characters in there, and the spacing is correct, like you saw in the movie. But there's more. You could say, well, I, I standardized the width. I can take this from the texture, but I showed you already in the texture that there is a sort of natural, intrinsic unitization. And this unitization was, of course, an important element of monotype. So if you say I have the stem interval as a constant factor, you can divide this stem interval and refine your units, which makes it possible also to make uh, the spacing more refined, and why would you do that? Not only for production reasons, but if you control that, it makes the justifications of lines easier, because you can define the word spaces also in units. What kind of proof do I have? Well, I looked at this on top, Janson again, and, and you can see some, some strange things happening in the spacing. So this, this is explainable from the stem interval, but here, sometimes it's, it's, it's quite tight. So I looked whether I could use the stem interval and, and unitization and to, unit, to put the Roman on units, and I used here the Adobe Janson, and see whether I could reproduce what was happening here. And I came close. So the next step is you, you take the closest unitization that is possible to the first standardization of width. I made nine rows, and I placed the letters of Adobe Garamond, in this case, on these rows. And in some cases, there was an exception where I used kerning for the T by placing it here on the row of the E and the F. And this way, I could reproduce the, the spacing on top. And I investigated the matrices of and then you can see that the total width of these matrices can be defined into these units. 
Is there further evidence? No, not, not, there's no documentation about this. But if you look at Moxon, for instance, Moxon's unitization is, has always been uh, a question. What did he do? How did he do it? There are explanations which are very complex, but what I did, I used just the scale here at the bottom, and I put it on the letters, and then I found exactly the same system as uh, I could distill from the Renaissance type. I didn't change anything about the spacing here, so this is just an enlargement of, of his engraving and then his own units on it, and then you see the same structure. And if that is an intrinsic part, then it should be always uh, applicable. And in this case, you can see a narrower typeface here. Uh, this is the Gros Canon again, also called the Gras Canon, but sometimes Canon Romain. And you can see that the proportions are related to the rotunda, as I showed you, and that the M is quite narrow. So you should be able to space this too. And in this case, this is even more complex. Uh, this is from the Psalterium from 5051. And Van de Kere cast the type by eye. He was a punch cutter, he could do that. But probably he made this n more narrow M for the casting. And this is in line with what Fournier describes his, in his manual typographique. You take the M as a basis for your spacing. So the spacing here is not based on the, on the original M, but the original M is used in the words. So. Ah. So can I use this? Is it possible to, to reuse this knowledge in such a way in digital type? Well, I can. I can, I can find the stem interval of every typeface. I can take the M if it's more narrow. And the more narrow M, if you ask type designers, why do you make your M more narrow? Mostly they will say, well, you have to, otherwise it becomes quite wide. Well, who cares? You never look at an M, or oh, this is a wide M, because you see this patterning, and uh, there are a lot of designers like Van Krimpen, like Janson, like Gardemont, like Cranjon, just used twice an N as basis. But if you want to have a tighter spacing, you can make a more condensed M. And in the French Renaissance, you see this in the larger typefaces, and you would do the same. You would make a larger typefaces face more tightly uh, space than one for text purposes, and probably you will adapt the length of the serfs too. And then the larger typefaces of Caramon and Grandjean show, and Van de Keerde show shorter serfs, which are also an indication then for putting the registers in the mood. So you get a tighter spacing for larger point sizes, and in that context, it makes sense to make the M more condensed. Now we come to Lucas, his cadenser. If you distill this system and you see that it actually is intrinsic, it has always been there, and when type is morphologically related, it should be uh, applicable also everywhere. And on top you see Adobe Janson, then Adobe Garamond, and then Adobe Kesslen. And these were spaced immediately with the same table. What happens, the units are, of course, font-specific, because you use the stem interval, and if you, your typeface is more condensed, your units will be smaller too. So if you use the same for uh, Concorde, it will work. And now you could say, well, this is a trick. And this is one of the complex things of this system. It works quite well. I think that I prove that it has been there always, but some designers will say, well, spacing, I will do by eye. I will do it better by eye. And I did, of course, test with students, and we compared the spacing, the auto spacing, with what they did by eye. And in many cases, it was just as good or even better, this. So you could use it uh, as a sort of second opinion. If you think, uh, I, do it, I want to do it by eye anyway, at least you could test the tool and use it. But it's not only a spacing tool, it's a design tool, because it shows you the patterning of your typeface here, and you can adapt, actually, your design to the patterning. So you have a unitization, which is intrinsic, and you can use that to, to yeah, actually improve your typeface. 
even more. And also you define spacing not anymore in one thousandth of an M, which is, has nothing to do with what you are doing actually as type designer, but, but now you are using units which are directly related to your design. Lucas also made, on my request, another tool, the calculator, cadence calculator. And it shows the similarities in width and actually the treatment of the distances to the side bearings uh, in different time phases translated into cadence units. And you can see that often it's almost the same, irrespective of whether it's a wide type phase or a more condensed one. Um, you'll find the same effect. How does the system work? Quite simple. You have extreme or you have the distance from stem to side bearing. So you could have extreme extreme like in the O. You could have stem to stem or stem extreme or extreme stem. That's, that's all there is. You can make a table. You can distill a table with a cadence collator of an existing font, and you can immediately apply it also to the bold version, for instance, because the bold version has the same basis and will be spaced immediately, uh, actually correctly, if you made it uh, correctly, of course. An example with a small error here in the J. And now Lucas will give you a live demonstration. Lucas. So back to the digital version of Frank's research. Um, Frank was talking about uh, the grid, uh, which is more or less working like an accordion. So um, it's um, uh, dependent on the design or um, on the proportions. Um, it is flexible. So, um, uh, depending on the factor, the division, um, the grid changes, and this is also happening if your design is like really wide or condensed. So, as Frank already mentioned, um, uh, there is a spacing table um, for certain kind of like a genre of typefaces, and um, these tables can be applied to um, a regular weight and a bold weight, for example. Um, I can show a quick example. So these tables um, are valid for, for a morphological group, morphological related group. So if I use this one, um, there are there are a few things you can adjust. So you you basically have to make sure that uh, the measurement is like correctly. It measures the the stems or it cuts the stems in a proper way. And then there are, there are certain exceptions like the F, the horizontal bar, and um, when you batch. Uh, auto space. When you apply batch auto spacing, it tries to find uh, the the horizontal bar. And um, another exception is the G. Um, this is also automatized, um, so um, you can actually immediately apply the spacing. You can adjust components. Can you show the space center? Is it so yeah. that it's live. This takes a second. So this is the result. And if I apply the same things with a bolder weight, I would simply change the division to a higher factor. So the spacing gets tighter. Uh, don't get confused that the grid doesn't fit because you, that this is not necessary. So um, you you also have another view where you can see the the actual result. Uh, the reason that it doesn't fit, you have a rounding to the 1,000 units of the M, 
So there's always a small deviation somewhere. So this is uh, the bolt. You know, so. Um, what else? Um, you could eventually, I mean, you have to adapt these, these spacing tables, you have to extend them. Um, at the moment, they are only upper and lowercase letters, so there are several ways to extend or modify these spacing tables. There's a small text editor that's the most simple version. You could simply copy-paste any entry. Um, actually, this is not necessary for, for uh, an accented glyph. But um, this is one way you could also um, completely reduce um, the units uh, so the table gets modified. Um, if you would want to uh, space small caps or um, um, edit values for, for small caps, you would simply uh, use the entries like this, uh, copy it to a text editor. Um, um, there's also, um, you would simply use the, the uppercase in this case as a basis, and then you would change it to lowercase like this, and then you would simply replace um, the equal sign by dot .sc, depending on your naming and then you would um, directly go back to the tool, and now you already have a, a basis for the small caps spacing. Uh, again, you don't have to develop those tables for um, single typefaces. You are working on a morphological related group, and um, yeah, as, as you've seen in the first examples, uh, it can be applied to um, yeah, related uh, sensor of typefaces. Um, and as Frank mentioned already, there's another tool which more or less reverse, reverses the pro process. Um, uh, you could, for example, um, provide a folder of fonts um, I would quickly show an example. Um, so you can extract from existing fonts like these spacing tables. Uh, you would collect a group of a genre of typefaces, could be slab serifs. Uh, they should all um, be like the same weight, or usually a regular weight. So I simply uh, select the folder. Um, I try to find the F bar again. I make my measurements. Um, the reason of the F bar is that the calculation can be done in case of an F from the terminal or from the bar. So if you have a table which calculates from the bar, it should not calculate from the terminal. That's the reason. So I'm now um, extracting or saving the spacing table. And um, I can immediately import it back in the second tool. So, um, and I could immediately apply it to any existing, sorry, this is already auto-spaced, uh, just a second. So this is again a, a messed up typeface. Um, and I have to check the settings again. Oops. And then I can so 
So this is what I just extracted from the existing typefaces. And it, of course, it works with sans-serif typefaces. I can also show an example, or of course with italics. Um, let's have a look at sans-serif. And can you show at the end the comparison of the original spacing and okay. of a couple of typefaces and the uh, cadence spacing? So I would um, take Lucida, for example, and I can show you the original and the automatic spacing. So this is again the messed up version. This is the original, and then I have to change the spacing table, which is this one, I think. The idea is that now you have to change the spacing table for sans-serif and serif typefaces, but that the program itself recognizes whether it's a sans-serif or whether the curves are flat, and then automatically it will select the right uh, table for the typeface. And you could, could also change uh, the basis for the calculation of the, of the uh, stem interval. This could be either M or N. Sometimes M is more condensed, so your, the, the outcome will be slightly more condensed. Um, Ah, okay. Uh, I changed the division, so I have to change it back to 32, which is the default value for regular weight. And so this is the auto spaced version, and this is the regular version. Uh, sometimes the space glyph is a bit different, so. In Lucida, it's, let's see, um, 316, and here it's 200. So I can also change this. So. So on top is the original version, and below is the aut automated version. And yeah, there are also some additional functions to um, adjust certain glyphs afterwards as a, sep a second step, or um, you could space the groups, or um, do do spacing on. Um, Accented glyphs, if they are not like components, um, you can also um, include alternates. Uh, sometimes um, the shape of the G is different, so a table could could also have a, a different sh shape or an entry for for another shape. And. <coughs> There's one thing in, in such a demonstration, it looks more complex now than it is. Actually, it is an extremely simple tool, and you don't have to do much, but, but um, that's actually something that happens with every demonstration we give. Uh, it looks more complex at the end than it is. It is extremely simple, and it is actually a design tool. So when you're designing, you can immediately make the spacing and see what is happening and adapt your typeface to the spacing. And actually, that is what happened in the Renaissance. So the spacing was first, the patterning was first, and then the adaptation of the uh, type, like the length of the serfs, uh, was done. And uh, nowadays, we are used to look at equilibrium of white space, but also we are trained to do it by eye. But the fact that you are capable of reproducing spacing as it was originally meant by eye doesn't mean by definition that it was done optically uh, at first. And we are so conditioned with type that we can do this, and at the same time, um, uh, there's, there is a certain room for deviation 
because the, the reader is quite tolerant when it comes to this. But the, 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 the intrinsic patterning, which was at the beginning in Roman type, you can actually reproduce with this. And uh, Lucas, um, as a last thing, can you show a few examples of the, the prepared typefaces where you show the original spacing and the calculated spacing that you did at the beginning of the uh, session? Yeah. If you are interested, Lucas, of course, is very much willing to give you a live demonstration. If you brought your typefaces with you, that's even more nice. Then, then you could test it directly and see what happens. Uh, Lucas made it working for Robofont and for the glyphs. So. And tomorrow uh, we have a session uh, around 12 o'clock. And uh, if you are interested, I can tell you a little bit more about my research and, uh, and show you some more examples. And Lucas can demonstrate and also a bit more his cadenza. So this is, for example, um, Adobe Caslon. Um, compared on top is the auto automated version and below is the original. Um, then we have... Can, can you give it some time? Because I think yeah. it goes too fast okay. for the audience. You, you, you have seen it before. Okay. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. Um, how do you see this application, this plugin, um, acting during an average font workflow? Because I, if I think at myself, um, I'm not doing all the time kind of Roman proportion typefaces, which is what mostly we have seen on the screen. But it works also for italic. Okay. Well, we, we skipped the italic, but actually, uh, can you show the italic one? So it is not only Rome, because okay. the italic uh, in the Renaissance has basically the same patterning. Okay, yeah, yeah. can I? And uh, basically, in, in which phase? Because usually, if I draw, I address the set width of my glyph in that specific moment, then, yeah, from time to time, you just, you have, you have sample proofs, you fix stuff, but it's very much intertwined. So uh -huh. I don't really see, um, as a detached or something that comes after, like well, well as soon as you start spacing, you could you could say I do auto spacing, and immediately you have a spacing which is intrinsic for your design. But there's another thing um, with my students in the Hague and Antwerp. I also train or train. We, we test another approach. First, the patterning using the letter modeler, and then adapting the typeface to the spacing. So the spacing is fixed at the beginning. And um, perhaps you know the Fontsmith typeface Bravo, which was released. Uh, that was based originally on the letter modeler. So first, the spacing, Fernando made the spacing with the letter modeler, and then he started working on the details. And I think that that is a more proper way, actually, because uh, what, what happens if you make your serves very short, it will influence the spacing. If you say, I want to make a, spacing, a typeface for smaller point sizes, then these details are directly connected to the spacing of the typeface. So I would, would implement this at a very early stage of your design. Immediately look at what happens with the patterning and then start looking at the details. But we do the opposite nowadays, mostly. We start in work letters and then you, you start looking what do they do they in words. But uh, I would say at an early stage in the design process. As a second opinion, if you think that you can do it better optically, then at least it will help you to define what you do better optically. And if you do it better optically, you can adjust the para parameters of the program in such a way that it will do the same things parametrically as you do optically, but then every time, again, in the same manner. So this is the italic, but I guess this wasn't the question, but... Um this is an example. Yep. Thank you.